part of the, uh, the thinking behind this one is it's a continuation <coughs> of uh, the, the way we open the year, thinking about the year ahead. Now, anybody who's heard me speak at one of these in previous years or read a couple of my blog posts will know that I'm actually a bit of a skeptic when it comes to the ability to deliver um, economic forecasts or, in particular, sort of focus point estimates. And I think um, I've, in the past I've tried to follow Winston Churchill on this one. He said, I always avoid prophesying beforehand. It's always much better to prophesy after the event has already happened. Um, that way you can make sure you get it right. Um, but we don't really have that luxury. And I do think that there is, and this is sort of my standard defense for, for forecasting when people say, well, you guys always get it wrong. Why do you keep doing it? Well, aside from the other defenses, well, as long as people keep paying us to do it, we'll keep doing it. But the, the more profound defense for why we keep doing the forecasting is I actually think it's a really useful exercise to think about what we think might happen, what are the risks, what are the issues and challenges out there. And in effect, it's sort of like a, a scenario view of the world. And by doing that, even if we can't put too much faith in exact point estimates of what the world might turn out to be like, it at least prepares us a bit more for what some of the shocks and surprises might be. And it also challenges our own thinking about how we understand the way that things are happening. So um, keeping that health warning in mind, what do I think that the world economy in 2009 is going to be like? Well, it's pretty obvious it's going to be grim. Um, there's not going to be a huge amount of cheer coming out of my presentation. Uh, 2008 was the year of the global financial crisis, um, a crisis that's now so ubiquitous that it has its own acronym. It's now the, well known as the GFC. Um, on, on a little aside here, actually, I have a, a slight feeling of vindication on this one. Way back at the end of 2007, I wrote a paper for the Lowy Institute on what was then still thought of as the US subprime crisis. And I sort of made the case for renaming this the TLA crisis, the three-letter acronym crisis, on the grounds that we had ABSs, MBSs, CDOs, this whole host of three-letter acronyms. I thought this would be a really catchy way to do it, to take it up. Of course, it never caught on, but I'm, I'm sort of cheered in a small way to think that, in fact, it has turned into a TLA crisis it, it, because it is now the GFC. So it was sort of, at least, you know, one very small bit of forecasting kind of came right if you stretch it a bit. Um, so but anyway, if, if 2008 was the year of the GFC, then 2009 is going to be the year of the real economy fallout. Um, this is the year when we see the consequences of the financial meltdown that we had last year. And we're already seeing it in action. Um, world activity is collapsing. Um, world trade is contracting. Commodity prices have already crashed. Unemployment, joblessness is on the rise. And with Reykjavik, arguably, um, we've seen the first government topple. And I would expect more to follow. So as my title suggests, and it's, as Alan said, it, uh, Andrew said, it's not a hugely cheerful one. I think 2009 is going to be a year of recessions. It's going to be a year of risks. And it's going to be a year of riots. We'll start with, um, I guess, the most obvious, which is the idea that it's going to be a year of recessions. Um, it's going to be a year of one great big global recession. And that global recession is going to comprise a whole series of individual country recessions. And in some cases, what will look like to be region-wide recessions as well. Um, one way to get a handle on this, and still bearing in mind my usual caveats about the perils of forecasting, especially in this kind of environment, is to look at the IMF's flagship publication, the World Economic Outlook. This is where the, the IMF, the still probably the, the peak body in the international economic architecture, comes together and says what it thinks the world is going to bring. Um, if we look back last year, the October 2008 World Economic Outlook, in that one the fund was sort of thinking next year is going to, 2009 our year is going to be grim. Um, but it's not, it's not going to be that grim. And in fact, what they did is they looked at what they'd said in July, when they thought the world economy was going to grow at close to 4% in 2009. And they said, no, the crisis is going to have its impact. We need to shave that forecast. We'll shave it quite a bit. We'll shave almost a full percentage point off it. And we'll think that the world may grow at something closer to 3% in 2009. And if it does that, that will be the worst outcome from the world economy since about 2002. That was in October. Um, the fund also warned that there were lots of downside risks. By November, those downside risks were all kicking in. So in the space of about a month, the fund said, well, actually, instead of the world economy growing at about 2.2% in 2000, in, in growing at 3% in 2009, we think it'll probably grow at about 2.2%. We shave three quarters of a percentage point of our forecast for 2009 in the space of a month. Um, that will make it the world worst outturn for the world economy since about 1982. We also think that the developed world, the rich world economies, are going to contract a little bit, maybe about minus a quarter of a percentage point, which would be the worst outcome for them since the Second World War. And the risks are still skewed to the downside. Fast forward two more months, and you get to this year to the January update of the forecast. And, so, and, and now the fund says, well, actually, we're going to shave the forecast again for 2009. 
Um, we've already had two cuts, if you remember, one of about a percentage point, one of about three quarters of a percentage point. In January, we add the two cuts together and we slash our forecast for world growth by about one and three quarter percentage points. And the fund now thinks the world economy will grow, if at all, by about half a percentage point this year. Um, that, for the world economy, is the res worst result in the post-war period. And it's also worth noting that those fund forecasts are done at purchasing power parity based exchange rates. That's the sort of exchange rate where you give a relatively high weight to emerging markets which are relatively faster growing. If you actually want to see it really pessimistic, you look at it market exchange rate basis, then the fund thinks we'll have an outright contraction this year. It also now thinks that developed countries will contract by about 2% this year. Um, why the roll call of forecast revisions? I think it tells you two things. The first one is that it's just really hard to get a handle on where we're at this year, that you, that you basically are in a situation where it literally almost every month you have to revise your forecast. Second, though, I think it tells us that since the end of last year, things have been getting bad, and they've been getting bad fast. The, the taste of revisions and the size of those revisions has been quite striking. Now, if you think about those, that global forecast, because that, what that global forecast is is an aggregation of forecasts for individual economies. And one way to sort of cross-check what those, those predictions for this year are is to look at the last set of data that we've had out for some of the world's biggest economies and see, well, how do they match up with that? And the last set of data, by and large, is the numbers that we've had for the final quarter of 2008. And the final quarter of 2008 is where, when you look at sort of the numbers, the trade numbers, the industrial production numbers on your graphs, that's when they fall off a cliff, when they all plummet sharply south. And the GDP numbers for that period, if you look at, um, you look at them at annualized rates, are all confirming that. So if we start at the epicenter of the crisis, if we look at the United States, the preliminary reading for US fourth quarter GDP at the end of last year was an annualized rate of contraction of almost 4%. So fairly sharp downturn in the US. If you then look at the UK, which arguably is the other economy which has the big financial center that's been most dislocated by the financial crisis, um, the fourth quarter GDP in the United Kingdom contracted at an annualized rate of about 6%. Um, you know, one of the worst performances, I think, again, since the Second World War for the UK. If you look at Japan, um, numbers that we've just had out recently, the Japanese economy contracted at an annualized rate of closer to 13% in the fourth quarter. And that's the worst economic quarterly performance for Japan for about 35 years, basically since 1974 and the, uh, the first oil shock, which really hit the Japanese economy very hard as a major oil importer. And strikingly, if you look at the euro area, and the euro area, again, in the fourth quarter, contracted annualized rate of about 6%. Um, and some economies, including Germany, which is widely seen as the strongest economy in the euro area, actually contracted by more than that. In fact, the German economy in the final quarter of last year contracted by more than the UK economy. Um, and significantly more than the U.S. economy. Um, and one of the interesting things, in fact, if you look down that list of numbers, is that out of those major economies, the U.S., which is at the heart of the crisis, has actually had the smallest contraction number uh, uh, across the, uh, the developed world. And one of the focus on the moment that people think about is, well, why, in particular, is Europe looking so weak? Uh, Japan, in a sense, has relapsed back to where it was, so in, in one sense, it's been less of a surprise. But why has the European performance been so bad? And sort of the the emerging consensus view out there is focusing on a few things. One of them is the relative disproportionate size of banking systems in individual European economies relative to their underlying economy. This is sort of the Iceland problem. The fact that you have a whole bunch of economies you know, from Iceland, but also the UK, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, um, within the Euro area, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, where you have very big financial sectors relative to the size of GDP of the national economy. So you had a disproportionate hit from the financial, hit, from the financial crisis. Um, the second reason is that it turned out that European banks were very big consumers of US-originated um, financial assets. So when you look at the distribution of where those big losses came from on, on um, subprime debt and, the, and the, you know, the creative financial instruments, it turned out that those Euro the European banks were heavily exposed to that. It also turns out that they're heavily exposed to a lot of emerging market risk. Um, depending on which part of Europe you're looking at, it, it, it varies as to which emerging market, but the one that people are focused on at the moment is that there's a big exposure to Eastern or emerging Europe. And since those economies are doing it very tough at the moment, there are worries about the health of the, of the banking system in countries like Austria, um, Italy, some of the other South, some of the East European countries who have very large exposures there. Um, the Austrian financial press um, I think it was last week we were quoted as describing the outlook for, um, for one of their banks as a result of its exposure to Eastern Europe as the equivalent of a financial Stalingrad. Um, not, not a pleasant metaphor you'd imagine in that part of the world. So a sense of 
again, of, of real risk hitting there. Another reason I think that, um, that Europe has done quite badly out of this is that its ability to respond in terms of policy response has been constrained. And it's been constrained in two ways. One is that if you look at several individual European economies, they actually already have very large public debt burdens. So their ability to switch to expansionary fiscal policy to try and offset the contract, the, the crisis and the growth slowdown has been limited. Um, and second, if you're a member of the euro area, your ability to get any benefit from, for example, the devaluation of your exchange rate or an independent monetary policy has been taken away from you as well. You're hostage to what the ECB decides to do with the monetary policy at the moment. So their, their ability, if you like, to, to react has been constrained. So I think there are sort of three reasons why the, uh, the crisis has been particularly bad for, um, for Western Europe and for East, uh, Western Europe at the moment. What, I mean, if you, if you think about those countries that I've listed there, so the Euro area, the United States, Japan, all of whom are showing very sharp contractions in, in, in output at the moment, all of whom are likely to shrink over the course of this year. Um, if you think of their share of the world economy, if you do it at, again at, at PPP, purchasing power parity rates, that's about 47% of world GDP. So almost half of world GDP is accounted for by those countries and will, who will undoubtedly see a contraction this year. If you measured it market exchange rates, that's about 60% of world GDP. So again, you get an even grimmer picture of where you think the world might be going. What about the developing world or emerging markets? Um, I don't think anybody buys it anymore, but if you remember a year or so ago, this was the great hope for the world economy, the, the decoupling thesis, the idea that there were large parts of the world economy that would be able to sail on more or less unaffected even if the United States and some of the other developed economies fell, fell over. Well, as we've seen again by looking at the data over the last few months, the, uh, the current outturn has basically driven the stake right through the heart of the decoupling thesis. It's now dead and, um, and, and buried. Um, this is sort of a quick tour. You know, probably the region that's most vulnerable at the moment is Eastern Europe or emerging Europe, where there are signs that it's staging something of a rerun of the 97-98 East Asian financial crisis, by which I mean you have countries with large current account deficits, with exchange rates that are falling very sharply as risk aversion mounts and where you have corporates and households who have big foreign currency exposures, which are now being blown up by, the, by those plummeting exchange rates. So you have a sort of very grim outlook for that part of the world. If you look at Latin America, um, relatively insulated from the crisis compared to some other regions, but even so, it's being hit in several cases by sharp falls in commodity prices. Um, Venezuela, Ecuador, to some extent Mexico, who are big oil exporters, are seeing sharp hits to revenue. Um, other commodity exporters, Argentina, Chile, to some extent Brazil as well, are seeing hits to their terms of trade. And if you're a country like Mexico, where the bulk of your trade is with the United States, you're seeing your export market, your, your most important export market, contract sharply. So the outlook for Latin America is not particularly rosy, although it's better than some other parts of the world. And then, I guess, if you look at our own region, East Asia, um, here the, the big impact has been through the contraction in world trade, um, through that collapse in developed country demand. Um, hitting at a time when, unfortunately, several of the region's key economies were actually trying to tighten policy and slow their economies anyway because they were worried about overheating. So they were, they were hit, if you like, by a double whammy at the same time. We've seen a stalling in regional growth and sort of truly dramatic export and import contraction numbers. Um, if you think, for example, of a small open economy like Singapore, which is basically heavily geared to the world economy, and if you look at the last quarter of last year, the, um, the rate of, annualized rate of contraction of the Singaporean economy was something like minus 17%. Um, a bigger economy like South Korea was minus 21% over the same period. Um, the Taiwan's numbers are due out today, I think, and could possibly be worse than South Korea's. So the, um, the, the very trade-dependent regional economies are suffering badly. And even the big ones, even China, for example, we don't have quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth rates for China, but the people who try and construct them estimate that in the final quarter of last year, China was basically at best flat, um, still growing in year-on-year -year terms, but in quarter-on-quarter, -quarter, um, depending on how you look at the, the range of estimates I've seen range from minus one to plus one, so basically flat. So even a very large economy, the one that was perhaps thought by many to be best placed to ride out this global turmoil has been suffering. So the recession story, I think, is, um, is, is going to be pervasive for this year. And even for those economies where we don't see outright recession, um, we're going to see up to a halving of, of growth rates in some cases, or certainly a substantial slowing in growth rates, even in, the, in those economies which are most sheltered from, from the world. Um, that leaves open a very obvious question, which is when do we get to turn around? Um, you know, the, initially, I think the more optimistic forecast was saying, well, towards the end of 2009, we'll start to see something, things start to look a little bit better. There are, I think, some people who 
not too many who'll still hold that. Um, sort of, I guess, moving more towards consensus now. It's early 010. We'll see a gradual recovery coming out then. I think that's possible. Um, you know, late 09, early 010 is a possibility. Um, if all of the policy stimulus that we've seen promised actually kicks in, delivers, and works the way it's supposed to. But I think there's a, um, a significant risk that we actually have another grim year in 010 as well. Um, that only as we get through to the second half of that that we start to see the world economy come out. Um, and again, I think this is one of those forecasts, like all of the others, that you would be revising month by month as you watch the data inflow come through. The big issue then is, is I think, on the recessions one, is, is what happens with all the stimulus that's been put in. How effective will it be? Do, are we going to get more of it? How will it work? Um, if you think on the monetary side first, and again, if you feel, look at the, 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 the developed world, you know, the, the rich world economies, it's already clear that we're approaching the end or the, the limits of conventional monetary policy. In some cases, we've already passed and breached them, and we're turning to non-conventional measures. So if you think for the Fed, for example, the Fed has cut rates from about 5 and a quarter percent, I think it was, back in um, summer 07, in northern summer 07, down to what's you know, known as a target rate of zero to a quarter percent of the Fed funds rate now, so effectively to zero. Um, the Bank of England has gone from 5 and 3 quarter percent to a bank rate of 1 percent and will continue to cut, I'm sure. Um, Bank of Japan is back with a zero interest rate policy. Um, I think it's 0.1 percent is the, the formal number. And even the Sado monetarists at the ECB, who are very, very reluctant to do this kind of thing, have shaved off about 225 basis points. The ECB rate is, I think, now at 2 percent. And again, markets are expecting a further cut to come. <coughs> Um, as you're bumping into that lower bound, that 0% bound, the Fed has been leading the way with so-called non-conventional monetary policy measures. So we're into the world of quantitative and qualitative easing. Um, quantitative easing is basically printing money, um, pumping money out into the economy. Qualitative easing is playing around with your balance sheet, um, shunting off the low-risk stuff, bringing on the higher-risk stuff, and trying to influence risk perceptions and market liquidity that way. We're seeing the Fed do some of both, and I expect to see more of that and more of that from other central banks as well. Um, but because we've, sort of, we've, we've hit sort of the barriers, at least to some extent, on monetary policy, although there's more, as I said, there's, there's more non-conventional stuff to do, um, that's turned the onus onto fiscal policy. So we've rediscovered over the, over the space of the last year the benefits of a stimulatory fiscal policy, and we've all become Keynesians again, or at least not, if not all of us, a large proportion of the policymaking community. And if you top up the announced fiscal stimulus plans as of, I think, early January this year, there's something between two and two and a half trillion dollars worth of planned government spending uh, to be injected into the world economy over the space of the next year or 18 months. Um, that includes uh, the, the recently signed Obama fiscal package in the United States. Um, it includes the four trillion uh, yuan Chinese program, which is about another 570, 580 billion US on top of the 780, 790 billion from the US stimulus package, about 260 billion from the euro area. That's something between two to three percentage points of world GDP, maybe a bit more actually, depending on what you think world GDP is going to be this year. Um, it's, it's a fairly substantial fiscal push, and the hope is that that will be enough to start generating some activity. There are a couple of risks about that. Well, there's one, of course, which is that some people just don't believe that um, the fiscal policy actually does deliver and does work. I mean, I think that is, is wrong. That's, I think I've, confessed here before, I'm an economist from the Keynesian tradition, so I, I am a believer in fiscal stimulus. However, it does seem to me that there are a couple of things that you have to worry about as to whether this will work. Um, one is just whether it will actually be big enough. If you look particularly in some of the rich world economies at the scale of output gaps, you know, the gap between what the economy should be growing at and what it will actually grow at, uh, which, which, are turning out, which are being estimated as very large, and the scale of likely fiscal stimulus that's coming in. Um, unless you make heroic estimates about the size of the multiplier, um, that's the bang for your buck you get from government spending, then it's not clear that it'll be enough to close those gaps. It, it, it should put a big dent in them, and it would be better than doing nothing, but it's not clear that, in, at least in all cases, it'll be enough to close them. Um, second, fiscal stimulus is a hostage to political debate and discussion. Now, at one level, it clearly should be. These are things that will change the trajectories of economies for a long time, including in terms of the debt burden for future generations. So it's not something that you can wave a wand and say, no political debate. But on the other hand, the longer and the more rancorous the political debate, the less effective for a given fiscal stimulus. And again, I think if you look at the experience that we've seen in the US and the way that confidence waxed and waned over the Obama package, you can see how politics can take a toll. Um, and, and third, and I think this is, this is quite problematic, for, for, for a number of countries where you already have very large public debt burdens, 
there is an issue of whether when markets and when consumers and taxpayers look at planned fiscal stimulus and look at what that means for the debt burden going forward, whether worries about fiscal sustainability or fiscal solvency will undermine your standard Keynesian influence of putting more government money into the economy, where people may, there's a risk that in some cases people might say, well, look, we already have overstretched public sector balance sheets. If you're taking on even more debt, if you can stretch them out even further, that's going to mean that you know, your fiscal position comes unsustainable, and that has actually a negative effect on confidence so much that it offsets any bank, your buck that you're getting from pumping money out. So there are, there are reasons um, which will vary across the economy for being concerned about whether the fiscal stimulus will deliver enough and how quickly it will deliver enough to, to if you like, jumpstart the economy. Um, but to be clear, I think in the absence of public action, both fiscal and monetary, we'll be waiting an awful long time before the private sector gets us out of this. Governments and policymakers do have to step up and do this. Okay, so that's the, the first, first one, recessions. First of my three R's, if you like. Um, the second of my three R's is riots. Um, and again, we've already seen riots, um, in particular in, in across Europe, both West and East. Um, we had protesters start storming um, the, uh, the, the Treasury and I think in, in Parliament in Latvia, for example, in the same week that the, the governor of the Central Bank of Latvia went on TV and pronounced that his economy was clinically dead. Um, <laughs> I mean, he was, he was doing so to suggest that they had about three or four minutes in which they could try and revive it and jump start it, but it clearly wasn't the way to reassure the punters. Um, we've already said that you know, the, uh, I, I, Iceland went broke and its government went out of office. Um, I think the, the outgoing prime minister was quoted earlier, I think it was, it, was, it was late last year, saying, well, there's not much left to do now but go and fish, such as the state of the economy. And um, his electorate, I think, have now sent him off to go and fish. Um, there have been major strikes or pu public protests in France, in the UK, um, the protests in British jobs for British workers. Uh, the recent G7 meeting in, in Rome was delayed because Italian workers were protesting the economic policies of their, um, of their government. So you've seen public protests. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a surprise. I mean, one of the things that's happening as I say, is we're starting to see the real economy fall out from the crisis. So already, if you think about it, voters and in countries which don't have elected governments, non-voters, already people have seen their wealth shrink, shrink markedly. Um, and, and in many cases, in, in many parts of the world, um, where we've had pension reform schemes, where people have been told, you're now responsible for your own retirement, go away, put your, put your money in financial assets, and that will tide you over when you retire. People who are looking forward to a, what they thought might have been a comfortable retirement have seen that opportunity ripped away from them. So there's already, there was already a level of discontent, I think, before, the, you know, just from the financial implications of this. But now, as people are starting to be laid out of work, as people are being made unemployed, and the unemployment rates start to creep up, that discontent is getting more focused and more angry. Um, in the US alone, for example, we think since December 2007, the economy shed about 3.6 million jobs. In January alone, um, more than half a million jobs went. Um, estimates for India suggest in the final quarter of last year, more than half a million jobs were shed. Um, if you want some really big numbers, and the ones that have been getting a lot of press, of course, is the Chinese numbers. Um, official, so the official sector, um, some of the estimates suggest that over the course of this year, something like three and a half million, people, million jobs might go. But already, authorities in Beijing have said, if you look at the migrant worker sector, um, the number that's been thrown around is something like 20 million jobs may have gone already. Um, they also note that the, the, the annual inflow of migrants into the workforce is something like 5 million plus, 5, 6 million plus. So that's something like 20, 25 million people who will be looking for work this year in the Chinese economy and struggling to find any. The ILO, International Labour Organization, start of this year, said that the global financial crisis was going to turn into a global employment crisis. Um, their prediction was that, and depending on their scenarios, the total job losses over the course of this, this year would be something between 18 to 30 million on their base case scenarios, up to a potential of 50 million in a worst case scenario. Now, the ILO forecasts were keyed off one of those IMF forecasts I talked about, but not the, recent, the most recent and the most pessimistic one. I think it was keyed off the November one. So we already know, based, if they based it on the revised forecast, then we're not going to get their positive, you know, their quote, positive forecast of about 18 million. So we're probably up the, if, assuming, again, huge caveat over forecasting here, but you know, we're looking at some of their more pessimistic forecasts in terms of job losses. So big increases in unemployment. Um, big increases in unemployment combined with you know, big hits to wealth, combined with sort of that general sense of dissatisfaction with, um, with governments in many parts of the world anyway, suggests that we're going to see more governments fall, we're going to see more public protests, we're going to see more social unrest, 
Um, we've already been off to what um, a couple of the headlines have been saying is a winter of discontent in Europe. Um, we, it would be, we, we should expect to see more of that. We're probably at the early end. We're still at the early end of the job losses. We've got more of those to come. So there's not too much comfort on the riots side either. Uh, the third of the three R's was, um, were risks. Uh, you might think this is almost redundant. Um, <laughs> clearly, this is a year. Of, this is going to be a year of risks, um, and pretty much all of them are going to be to the downside. Although, you know, there may actually be some upside risks out there too. But we could all be really pleasantly surprised. The, um, the stimulus could kick in much earlier, much more effectively than we think. Um, and in fact, we could all be looking by the end of this year and thinking, well, look, all, all of our policymakers around the world stepped up to the plate, and we're coming out of this. Um, that's a very nice upside risk, but it's uh, it's not what I put a huge probability on. But yeah. It will try and inject the occasional mode of a bit of sunshine through the gloom. Um, but, but mostly we're, we're faced with a whole bunch of downside risks. And this, the list of those, these is extremely long. I um, mean, deflation is, is one obvious one. We're now back to having warnings about, because of these very large output gaps, that maybe we'll be tipping back, at least in some economies, back into a, deflation, a period of deflation. And just as the world economy had been, has been rediscovering uh, one old economist, John Maynard Keynes, over the last couple of weeks, we've been rediscovering another one, Irving Fisher, um, the guy who wrote about debt deflation, debt deflation spiral. Um, I noticed both The Economist and um, Paul Krugman in his column for the New York Times have cited Fisher over the past week. So again, the sort of that sense that the, we, we, we might be facing, facing a deflationary risk has come back. Um, another risk that's getting a lot of um, play at the moment is the possibility of a breakup of the euro area. Um, people have been looking at credit default swap spreads, um, uh, sort of credit default swaps and bond spreads for a number of the heavily, more heavily indebted and worst performing euro area economies and saying, will these guys cope or will they be pushed out? Um, and if they do be pushed, if, 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 if they're pushed out, that means a collapse of the euro area and things look very bad. I, hey, for another note of optimism, I suspect that scenario won't play out. Um, but optimism's had a bad run over the last two years. So, and it's certainly one that markets are worrying about. Another one which is much more likely is a severe emerging market crisis. As I said, we're, we're sort of staging a, a rerun of 97, 98 in Eastern Europe at the moment. So that's probably the most likely um, region where we might see in country, more countries fall over. We're already seeing a few tilt, toppling. We've seen Iceland go already. So a major, a major emerging markets crisis could, could be another crisis. The list goes on. But I, I want to focus on three here, which I think are worth paying a, a bit of attention to. Um, the three are, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do them in reverse order. The, the, the third one is um, what I'll call Murphy's Law. Um, and I'll, I'll, that's the one I'll, I'll try and finish on. And it's probably the grimmest of the three, but, but it's kind of entertaining. Um, the second one is about um, deglobalization. And basically, it's about policy assisted deglobalization. And the first one is about adverse feedback spirals or adverse feedback loops. Now, we'll, we'll start with that one. This one, if you, the, the IMF has been warning about this for a while. It's been saying one of the big dangers that the world economy faces, and one that's already underway, is this what it calls a pernicious adverse feedback loop between the financial and the real sector. And basically, what they mean by that is, is that as the financial sector is contracted, as you've had financial crisis, that's, that's knocked back onto to, to real activity. So as financial wealth has evaporated, as credit has disappeared, that's had a knock-on effect. You know, consumers have seen their wealth shrink, so they've wanted to save more and spend less. Um, they've, they've, consumers and producers are finding it harder to get credit, so they can't invest or can't spend, spend the way they used to. That drags down the real economy. As the real economy goes down, that pulls down the, the, the value of other assets on banks' balance sheets, so consumer loans or real estate loans or, or loans to corporates. That goes down, and you, and you risk a downward spiral. And the fund has been warning repeatedly that that's one of the biggest risks out there for the world economy. And fixing that downward spiral basically means that you have to fix the banking system. And that's the reason that you have the intensity of the debates that you have at the moment over things like the Geithner Plan in the United States. How do you sort out what's now become known as zombie banks? You know, the banks which are the living dead. Banks which people increasingly suspect in some cases are insolvent at, at current market values. How do you deal with that? And there's a, I think there's a broad consensus out there that unless and until you fix up the banks, unless, then you can't break that spiral. Until you, and if you can't break that spiral, you don't get world growth back up. 